PhD from um, the University of Cape Town. She currently works for the South African National Parks uh, in the Cape Research Center in a senior position as senior marine biologist. Uh, her professional appointments have been with the Institute for Communities and Wildlife in Africa, the South African Institute of Aquatic Biodiversity, and um, uh, technical reports. Uh, she uh, authored 13 peer-reviewed journal articles, five technical reports, 31 symposia presentations, two book chapters, and a Google Scholar link. She is frequently invited to speak because uh, she, what she has to tell you is always very interesting. Uh, to her technical skills, she's a small vessel skipper with 15 years experience, uh, a rescue diver, an archaeologi archaeological diver. She has medical first aid training and emergency medical services driver's license computer skills, which everyone has to have now anyway. And I think I'll let her tell you more about herself. <laughs> Hang on, I want to say something else. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, please enjoy Alison. She was just telling me about how she's been swimming with great whites and with authors. So I hope she's going to tell you something about that because it sounds fascinating. OK, thanks for coming, and thank you, Alison. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, Maxine, for that uh, wonderful introduction. We go way back um, uh, to, to the South African Museum. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming to our um, revealing the secret lives of sharks. Sharks has been one of my passions since I was a little girl, and um, I always love sharing some of the knowledge and um, uh, observations that I've seen over the years with, uh, uh, with all of you. Um, the way the course is going to be run this week is every day from three to four, we've got um, different speakers. Today it's going to be myself and uh, Katie Gledhill, who I'll introduce um, after my presentation. Is it echoing? Or is it? <laughs> um, and uh, tomorrow we'll have two more um, amazing women in science working on sharks and uh, that will follow um, for the rest of the week. So the first half of 15 minutes will be um, a general overview on a particular topic. Today we're going to start with shark biodiversity and, um, and then uh, the next 15 minutes will be spent in more detail um, on a case study or something more specific uh, to get really in depth into a particular topic. So um, it really gave us this opportunity to share the stage with these wonderful women uh, that you'll meet throughout the week um, and, and the amazing work that they're doing on sharks here in South Africa. Can I get a show of hands who's um, coming for the rest of the lectures? Who's, oh, fantastic. Oh, that just makes my heart absolutely happy. Great. OK, so we're going to have some time together this week. And uh, hopefully, we're going to have fantastic discussions and some great questions. If I can ask you to save your questions until both presentations are done, uh, we've left uh, about uh, 15 minutes at the end of both presentations so that we can have some discussion and answer some questions. So today, starting off, the uh, South Africa's shark showcase. Uh, really, um, great whites are certainly my most favorite shark, but they're not the only shark in South Africa. There are close to 200 species. And so I thought what we'd do to start off this course is to introduce you to some of those species um, and just show you what diversity is out there um, from, from the different species across the world and then focusing in on some of uh, the uh, amazing species in, in South Africa. So to start off with, sharks didn't always look like we know them today. Uh, so many of these weird-looking animals are your ancient sharks. 
um, more than 500 million years ago, um, we had animals which artists have depicted may have looked like this based on the teeth and the jaws that they have found in the fossil record. Now, we all know that sharks are made up of cartilage. They don't have bony um, skeletons, which means that cartilage doesn't um, uh, fossilize very well. So we often don't get full skeletons of um, sharks in the fossil record. But what we do get are teeth and uh, jaws and um, the occasional um, vertebrae every now and again, and then also some of the um, shark scales, or what we call denticles. And from those um, fossils that they found in the fossil history, artists have depicted what these sharks may look like. Um, so for example, um, in the bottom left-hand corner here, this jaw was actually discovered in the fossil record. So sharks didn't always look like we know them today. So where did it all change? Well, almost 450 million years ago, um, the first fossils um, which people attribute to being sharks were recorded. Uh, there is a little bit of debate around um, 20 million years or so, um, where some scientists believe they uh, started, or the first um, fossils were found in the um, Silurian um, uh, or, or Divisian period. Um, but uh, yeah, most um, paleobiologists say about 450 million years ago is the first fossil in um, uh, attribute to sharks. And this is way before dinosaurs came into the picture. So um, a lot of people believe that dinosaurs really were the first um, fossils, but sharks were almost 200 million years before dinosaurs even came onto the picture. And your first uh, mammals also appeared around about the dinosaur age. And then things really started to change about 66 million years ago. And this is when it's believed that the modern era of sharks um, exploded uh, into, into the fossil record, and that this was actually triggered by a mass extinction event um, which occurred during this time. So the, the modern rise of the sharks is attributed to around about 60, uh, just over 60 million years ago. So this just gives you an outline. Um, I thought I would start off a little bit um, uh, with, with the generals. Um, Sharks have a very typical uh, skeleton, but it does change uh, in size, in shape. Um, but generally, you'll have a, a dorsal fin or two. You'll have your caudal fin, which is your tail fin. This can be different shapes in different species. Um, you have gill openings. Uh, most shark species have more than one gill opening, but there are still some shark relatives, the chimera, chimeras, which only have one gill opening. Um, and then you've got your pectoral fins um, and, and, of course, those senses that sharks are so well known for, their eyesight and um, their smell and their electro sense. So this is just to give you a typical idea of, of the sharks. As I mentioned before, they have a cartilaginous skeleton. They don't have any bony parts. Um, and this actually makes them really flexible um, and they've got very different swimming behavior compared to bony fish, for example. So this is an outline of your different uh, shark family. So, so sharks are um, made up of uh, your sharks, which are your traditional uh, animals that we uh, attribute to, to sharks, like the great white shark. But uh, you also have your chimeras. So right at the top, um, your holiocephaly is your chimeras or your ghost fish. Um, I'll be talking to you a little bit about one that we find here in Cape Town along our coasts. Um, these uh, uh, ghost fish are uh, more um, similar to bony fish than other species of sharks are. We've got our skates and our rays. So these are also sharks, uh, fully cartilaginous uh, skeleton. Um, they just flat sharks. So among the scientific community, we often refer to flat sharks. And we have um, a specific day of the week where we give our flat sharks a little bit of love. Because in fact, this group of uh, sharks is very threatened. And Katie will be talking to you more about those. 
And then we've got our um, traditional um, sort of more of our, our, our sharks that we know. Um, and so there's these very broad groups, our chimeras or ghost fish, our rays and our skates, and then our, our sharks. So worldwide, uh, there's estimated to be uh, over 1,100 species. Now, this number changes all of the time. Um, and this is because new species are being discovered um, almost every single week or every two weeks. Katie will be going into that a little bit more. Um, so the publication that I took this from had 1,174 species. And then the latest publication that Katie sent me yesterday had um, a couple of more, jumped up to 1,192 species. And you just really can't keep track because these new species are being discovered all the time. Unfortunately, we're also losing species all the time as well. So those numbers are constantly changing. Out of that, um, 400 of them are, are categorized as, as sharks, and the others are your chimeras, your rays, and your skates. And in South Africa, we've got an incredible diversity of shark skates and rays. We've got over 180 different species, which is about 15% of the global number of species. So we really in a shark hotspot. So it's not just the great white shark um, that we hear so much about, really is um, this variety of, of species. And the really interesting thing, and this is where Katie will be going in depth, is that 34 of these, and the number has probably changed already, um, are only found in South Africa. They're endemic to our waters. You don't find them anywhere else in the world. So really, we have this really special place for, uh, for sharks. And they live in all the habitats. You find sharks across all the oceans. Um, you find them in the pelagic realm. So in this uh, photograph at the top there, that's an oceanic white tip. They are found way offshore, in deeper water, in the pelagic zone, and um, they really have to swim far and wide and migrate far and wide to find food and find mates. And then you've got the opposite on the other side. You've got your uh, pajama cat shark. Uh, they're one of our endemics, and they live on reefs and kelp forests. Um, so a very different habitat that they are living in. Um, this fantastical um, species here is the goblin shark. And this goblin shark lives hundreds of meters in the ocean, so far offshore, hundreds of meters down. Um, and it's a really weird looking beast. Um, and then you even get sharks in the polar seas, in the ice cold polar seas. That's a Greenland shark uh, there in the, in the right hand corner. So you really have sharks um, that have um, filled the niche in many different environments. You even have sharks that go into fresh water, such as your bull sharks. Um, they're able to tolerate the fresh water as well as the seawater. Um, so you really have them occupying all these different spaces. Um, and in South Africa, our diversity increases from moving from west to east. So we've got a lot more species in our warmer, warm temperate, tropical, subtropical areas than we do in our colder temperate areas. So this diversity increases from west to east. But they really do occupy all these amazing habitats. And because of this, they've all evolved very differently and to feed very differently um, on, on different prey species. Um, so for example, you've got uh, in the top left-hand corner your basking shark. It's the second largest shark, um, but it's a filter feeder. Um, it filters small zooplankton out the water as well as small fish. And then you've got your eagle ray. These are one of my favorite rays. Um, they, they take their little noses and their mouths and they shuffle in the sand and they're looking for crabs and worms and um, all kinds of uh, invertebrates that they then crush with their, with their jaws. Um, you've got these black tip sharks that are very well known at the Sardine Run, which is along our east coast. And they are in huge schools, and they will um, hunt with the common dolphins, and they'll feed on anchovies and sardines and other bait fish. Um, and then, of course, you've got the, the great white shark uh, that we all know very well as being um, present right here in False Bay, feeding on the Cape fur seals. But it's not the only thing they feed on. Um, a lot of people think Cape fur seals 
are their primary uh, food source, but it's not. They feed on other species of shark, uh, other species of fish. They even feed on squid. Um, and they even feed on sardines. So smaller white sharks will go into the sardine run and feed on sardines as well. So there's this huge diversity of, um, of, of feeding. And similarly, the, the way that they reproduce. Um, sharks, this is probably one of the most fascinating aspects of sharks, is that it ranges from sharks that um, uh, actually uh, lay eggs, um, and we call those mermaids purses, and you'll often find them on the, on the beaches. Has anybody found them walking along the beach, the shark eggs? Um, they're fascinating. I, I collect them, and you can tell a lot about what kind of species are in your area just by walking up and down the beach and looking for these shark egg cases. Um, that's a picture of one still entwined in kelp just off Simonstown of a puff adishai shark there on the far right-hand corner. Um, all sharks have internal fertilization, so unlike bony fish that spawn, um, Sharks all have internal fertilization, and it can be a bit rough. So you can see the um, male shark in the top. These are gray reef sharks. And what the male needs to do is, is grab and bite onto the female so that he can actually insert his clasper for reproduction, for mating. Um, and the female, she's the one lying upside down. They will actually go into what's called tonic immobility, which is a trance-like state. Um, and uh, it's thought to have come from um, uh, facilitating the, the mating. But these females often bear the brunt. Uh, they have these scars um, and these bites, and in fact, they've developed thicker skin than the males. Who would have said? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so all sharks have this internal fertilization, but um, uh, as I started off saying, some lay eggs, um, and, and they actually um, will uh, t uh, um, lay the eggs in kelp or on reef, and they'll intertwine them, and they'll, um, they'll just leave them there. Others, uh, and that's called um, uh, oviparous, others will lay eggs but they, uh, or, or produce eggs, but they won't actually lay them. The eggs will produce um, inside of the mother. So she'll produce her eggs, the baby will produce inside um, the, the egg inside the mom, and then once the shark pup is ready to be born, um, it will be born alive, and the egg casing will be discarded. Um, so that's the second kind of way that they, that they reproduce. And then many sharks will uh, give birth to, to live shark pups. Um, so uh, in this picture down here, you can still see um, the... Um, the umbilical cord of the shark, um, and uh, she's given live birth. And, and then I just had to throw that picture in on, on the right there, um, because <laughs> the little baby Ray, and we call them little raviolis. Can you see why? <laughs> um, and they're just the cutest things. Um, they really are. And so a lot of rays will give live birth as well, whereas your skates will produce the eggs um, that, we, that we have. So uh, this is the St. Joseph shark, um, or chimera. Uh, it's one of the ghost sharks, and it's an endemic species to South Africa. Um, it's a fascinating creature. Uh, there's a big fishery for these um, animals along the Western Cape. Um, uh, it's a traditional fishery along the West, uh, Western Cape. Um, where they use uh, trek nets to, to catch them. Uh, they're very, very fecund, which means they produce very fast compared to other species of shark. So most of you will heard that sharks reproduce really slowly, they grow really slowly, they take long to um, become mature. But these St. Joseph sharks are actually more like bony fish in this regard, where they actually produce quite quickly. Um, and this funny looking um, uh, nose of theirs, they use it to shuffle in the sand as well, looking for crabs and worms, and they also eat small uh, fish. So really fascinating animal, um, occurs on the coastal, shallow coastal areas of, uh, of the Western Cape, um, and these are, are egg laying, and in, and in fact this egg case over here is one of the largest egg cases that you can find on the beach. Um, these uh, elephant fish get to about a meter in size, and you can see with the hand there, these egg cases are quite, quite large, and you'll often find these lying on the beach. 
um, and they dry out really nicely and um, really fantastic to show kids and, and so forth. Um, the blue spotted stingray, this is another one of my favorites. Um, and and uh, these stingrays love to um, swim along the bottom and search also for uh, uh, crustaceans and shrimps and worms. Um, they are very, very brightly colored like this to warn predators that um, they are dangerous to eat. So they've got two venomous spines that are on their tail um, that can uh, really cause some damage and injury to any predator. Um, hammerhead sharks do like to, to try and eat these. Um, and they're one of the species where the, the mother produces the egg um, inside her uterus, um, and then the, uh, the embryo develops inside of that. And once the embryo is ready, then the, um, the, the stingrays will be born alive. Um, so fascinating, fascinating creature. This is my second most favorite shark. Um, this is the seven-gilled cow shark. Now, this is probably one of the most um, neglected sharks in, in our um, coastal waters, given that they are almost three meters in size and they occur right inside the kelp forests of Cape Town. And um, there was a dive site of Simonstown where you could dive with up to 70 of these almost three meter sharks in a one hour dive. It was a spectacular sight. Um, I say was, um, and you'll be hearing more about this from Alison Towner on Friday, um, but um, our killer whales have come in and shaken the whole ecosystem system up there. So um, at the moment, they are, are mostly absent from that aggregation site because they've been predated on by killer whales. Um, as the name suggests, they have got seven gill slits. So the elephant fish had one. Most sharks have five. These guys have got seven. That's parasites that you see sitting on the gill slits uh, in, in this picture. Um, and they are one of the more ancient lineages of shark. They only have one dorsal fin instead of two. Um, and they're really quite funny looking. <laughs> um, they're incredible to dive with. Um, they rest during the day, so scuba divers um, can, can get quite close to them without um, uh, interfering too much. Um, and they really are apex predators at, this, at the top of the food chain with white sharks. And this is why I say they've been so neglected, because these guys feed on seals, they feed on other sharks, and they feed on fish as well. And my master's student, um, uh, Lida Necker, who will also be presenting in this course, um, has shown fascinating results um, with where these guys sit in the food chain. Um, they really are spectacular uh, animals. This shark um, was the shark that got me started on my career. And uh, the way this happened was when I was 10 years old, my father used to take me crayfishing with him. And who's gone crayfishing before? So, so the way it works is you have your crayfish nets and you bait those nets with a little bit of sardine. And you put the nets down for um, uh, 30 minutes, an hour, however how people want to, some people have beers in between while they're waiting. Um, I was 10, so I wasn't allowed that. But um, uh, so you wait for the crayfish to climb into the, into the net, and then you pull it up. But um, these puff adder shy sharks are also attracted to the sardines, and so they would get caught in the net as well. And I was really worried about these little sharks. And in the top corner there, um, you can see it curled in a ball. So when they are scared, they curl into a defensive little ball. And they put their tails and they hide their heads under their tails, which is why I think they're called shy sharks. And um, I was really concerned about these little sharks. And my dad used to say to me, Alison, don't worry. Just kiss it on the nose and put it back in the water. And that is where my love for sharks developed when I was 10 years old. Um, and I, I don't kiss sharks on the nose anymore. <laughs> They're a little bit bigger with bigger teeth. <laughs> um, but these little puff adder shy sharks are also one of the species only found in South Africa, uh, endemic to our waters. Um, they are egg laying and um, their egg cases you can see on many of your dives in Cape Town. 
um, you can just snorkel down to 10 meters and you can see uh, the air cases wrapped around the kelp fronds um, with a little embryo developing inside. And in fact, if you swim in the tidal pools around Cape Town, have a look out for these air cases because you can actually find them in there as well. And people have um, watched, gone back uh, for, for days and weeks on end to watch the little shark develop inside these air cases. It's quite fascinating. Um, and they also eat crabs and, and small fish and so forth. And then, of course, there's, there's the great white shark. Um, I started working on great white sharks in 1998. So um, it's, been, it's been quite a while now. And the most fascinating thing is how I learn new things all the time. So you think you know something about the animal. And my whole PhD was about these sharks. And I'll be telling you all about that on Friday. But it's all changed. I read my PhD now, and I'm like, oh, that's not right anymore. <laughs> so it just shows you how the environment and the habitats change and how these sharks adapt to that. Um, they are live bearing. Um, less than 20 pregnant great whites have been studied. Um, and we know from that that they have between 2 and 11 pups, all over a meter in size. Now, can you imagine what that looks like? In fact, there's a viral photograph going around. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen it about this giant great white off the coast of Hawaii that's been feeding on a sperm whale. Um, it's been getting a lot of international media attention, and there's a lot of speculation about whether this big female is pregnant or not. And, um, and uh, a lot of scientists know that you can't tell whether a shark is pregnant just by looking at it, and it looks like it's big, big tummy. Um, and, and so there's still a lot of speculation about it. But can you imagine what a belly looks like um, of, of 10 great whites of over a meter in size that they're carrying? I mean, this is, this is phenomenal. And when they are born, they are born like miniatures of their parents. They are ready to swim off, um, and, and they're ready to survive on their own. There's no parental care um, when, it comes to, when it comes to these sharks. And of course, they're feeding on seals, um, dolphins, um, they're scavenging on dead whales, and, and as I mentioned, even smaller things like squid and small species of fish, and, um, uh, and, and sometimes even crabs. I mean, they're really opportunistic. So this is the largest fish shark in the sea. This is a baby whale shark. Now, I find this fascinating, so I'm going to go over here. This is what an adult looks like. This is the biggest fish, up uh, to 18 meters in size. It's the size of a bus. And that is what its pup looks like. Incredible, isn't it? And uh, there was a female whale shark that was found with 300 pups inside her uteruses. 300 pups. I mean, I just, my mind boggles. Um, but so little is known about these juvenile sharks. Um, and it's really only opportunistic fishing. Nobody really knows where these little babies are born and where they grow up. Um, but boy, I mean, just look at that. It's just a phenomenal little shark. You just want to take it home and cuddle it. <laughs> um, but of course you can't. <laughs> um, so, so, so whale sharks are the biggest sharks in the ocean. They are also filter feeders. So they're um, feeding on zooplankton and small species of fish. Um, and they can often form these massive aggregations where they meet up together to form on very um, uh, rich, nutrient-rich waters, such as the coast of Tanzania. You can get hundreds of these whale sharks um, feeding together in a, in a group. Um, the interesting thing is they are another one of those species where um, the eggs are produced inside, but the young are born alive. Um, so really fascinating um, creatures. And then this is the, the smallest shark in the world. This is the dwarf lantern sh shark. Now, unfortunately, the best picture I could find of um, was this dead specimen, because they um, live at 500 meters, up to 500 meters down. So they're not easily uh, uh, studied. Um, and the really interesting thing is that they can bioluminesce as well. And we think it's to attract their prey, so they eat krill and um, tiny crustaceans and fish. Um, and then the mako shark. This is a really fascinating shark. 
Um, it's the fastest shark out there. Um, it's been estimated that they can reach up to 70 kilometers in burst speeds, um, and they can jump five to six meters out of the water after um, their food or sometimes when they've been caught by fishermen. Um, they give live uh, birth, just like their cousins, the great white sharks. They belong to the same family. And of course, they live in a pelagic habitat. So if you want to see these guys, you have to travel two, three hours off Cape Point, um, and you can go and see them in, in the pelagic grounds. And of course, when it comes to diversity, there's not just diversity among species, but within species as well. So this is a couple of examples of animals um, where uh, researchers around the world have been able to um, use the um, differences in how they look to study them. So um, you've got these uh, spot patterns in uh, the um, uh, leopard shark, the manta ray, you've got these black patches on underneath its belly, you've got the whale shark and these spots. Uh, the great white shark, you've got the dorsal, um, which is uh, dark, and the belly, which is white. And where they meet, there's a pattern, um, which is unique to each shark, as well as their dorsal fins, which are unique to each shark. And scientists can use these patterns um, to study individuals. So instead of having to go out and, and mark them with a tag or um, another way of, of marking individuals, um, you can actually use their natural markings. Um, because they're all different among these species. And one example, um, this, is, this is a very well-known shark uh, from uh, False Bay. Uh, it's called Nutcase. Um, because when I first encountered it in 2004, it was a little bit mad. I really, it, it, chill, it kind of calmed down as it, as it got older, but um, uh, in, in the beginning, it was really quite boisterous around the boats. And you can see uh, the very clear notch at the top of the dorsal fin, and over the years how, how we were managed um, to keep tabs on it and, um, and uh, actually work out how often it came to, to False Bay, um, how long it stayed for, just by using its natural markings. And then even uh, non-physically, behaviorally, Sharks are very diverse. And this is an emerging field um, in, in shark science, looking at shark personalities. And research coming out of the Bahamas, um, where, where Katie has actually worked for a number of years, um, shows that sharks do have personalities. Some sharks are bold, some sharks are shy. And, um, and uh, the, the research also shows that they like, or some of the animals like to hang out with certain individuals, just like you and I do, where we, we have our, our very close friends and then we have our friends that we see at the spa. Um, and sharks tend to do the same thing. Um, so there's a lot of uh, diversity among um, the, the behavior of sharks as well. And this really is an exciting field of, of um, shark science that is just emerging now. So to end off, um, before I pass on to, to Katie, I just want to say that uh, I think this is the start of a fantastic week. I'm glad that most of you are going to be joining us. I think sharks are awesome, and I want to tell you a little bit more and show you more um, uh, about these sharks. Um, and also just to celebrate these animals that we find here in South Africa. Um, you'll be hearing about the threats they face in another lecture. Um, and, uh, and, and what we can do to help conserve them. But for now, let's celebrate them. Thank you. So I'm just going to hand over to Katie.
specialist group to assess the conservation status of endemic sharks and raise the size of Littorial Africa using the IUC Red List criteria. So thank you very much to Katie for, for joining me on this presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and that was a really um, inspiring and exciting talk. Um, I think Alison and I could probably speak for a week just on the topic of biodiversity, um, and this is a big challenge for me to try and limit myself to 15 minutes to talk about biodiversity and endemic species. Um, but as Alison mentioned, a lot of the research um, that I focus on is endemic species here in southern Africa, and I'm particularly interested in threatened and data deficient species, which I'll be speaking about not only today, but later on in the week with Charlene as well. So just to recap quickly, we can never pinpoint this number, but there's over 210 different species of sharks and rays here in southern Africa and about 30 of them are endemic to the region. So what is important for that is because a lot of these sharks have, and rays have very small distribution ranges and they have very highly habitat specific um, areas that they live and things like that. That makes them really vulnerable to different environmental and human induced but pressures. So for example, if they live in a small area, you can imagine that if there's some sort of change that comes along, an environmental change or fishing, then this can wipe them out um, very, very quickly. So Southern Africa or Southeast Africa particularly um, is a really important area for the conservation of um, threatened endemic species. So what we've got here is a map um, produced by our colleagues, um, Lindsay Davidson and Nick Dolby. And it's a heat map, so the warmer colours, so the orange and the yellow and the red, um, is how many threatened endemic species are in a certain area per cell. So you can see along here on the coast of Brazil, there's a lot of red and orange, and also here in southern Africa, particularly as Alison said, not only do we have um, a lot of species diversity on the east coast, but we also have a lot of um, particularly endemic species and threatened endemic species. And that goes up into the coast of Mozambique as well. So the two groups that we seem to have a lot of endemic species for some reason here are the, the cat sharks and the skates, two of my favorite groups. And combined with those two groups together, they make up almost half of just of all the different species that we have here in South Africa um, is made up of those two groups of different animals. So it's really, really interesting. Um, what's also really interesting in other parts of the world, a lot of these species are actually occurring offshore, whereas here we seem to have them inshore, particularly cat sharks, which are usually, if you look around the world, a lot of the time they're deep sea species, and certainly we have deep sea species here. But it's really interesting that we seem to have a lot of near shore species um, with these guys as well. So a bit of a busy figure here, and I'll talk you through it, but this is actually a good follow-on from what Alison was talking about in terms of evolutionary history. So there was a study followed on from that previous map that I had up of all the threatened endemic species and where they occur in the world. Um, the same lab group also looked at evolutionary distinctness. So how far back in time um, and how distinct are all the different sharks and rays and where do they occur? So the whole concept behind all of this is that we want to, there's so many species, there's so many risks in the world, um, there's such limited funding. Um, so we really want to target specific areas for conservation planning and management. So it's just trying to identify different ways and different species in different areas that we might want to concentrate on. So what this study did was look at the um, evolutionary history of many sharks and rays. And as Alison said, some of the species like the seven gill, the great white, um, makos, um, and also some of the other species that I'll be talking about in a minute um, are very, very different. They don't have, uh, they, they call it pruning the Kondrukthian tree of life or the shark ray tree of life. If we lose some of those species, there aren't nearby species that are related closely to them. So it's just a different way of sort of looking at protecting evolutionary history of different species. So this, as I said, this is a follow-on map from the last one. 
So they produced this map, and what they tried to identify is not just threatened endemic species, but also looking at these evolutionary distinct species. And what they came up with was mapping areas of the world that they call triple threatened hotspots. So it's areas that have not only lots of endemic species all in one place, lots of threatened endemic species all in one place, but also lots of evolutionary distinct species all in one place. So a few other areas kind of prop up, um, West Africa particularly, but again, Southern Africa is a really important place for conservation of these areas. So we've got a lot of conservation attention um, all of a sudden coming onto the threatened endemic species here, which is really exciting, especially for people like me that have been ranting <laughs> for a little bit about this. So following on from this, the, um, there's a program called the Edge of Species of Existence, and what it's done is identify 50 different sharks and rays that are of conservation importance. Um, again, following on from threatened species, also ones that are evolutionary distinct and maybe don't have much conservation attention. So what we've got is a uh, top... 50 species, you can go and have a look at this, uh, this yourself. So it's just the top 50 edge species. Um, and some of the first ones, again, we have the great whites, the seven gills, some of those that have had a little bit more attention. But what's interesting that's come up is a lot of the threatened endemic South African species. Um, you'll notice here, there's no photo. And as Alison said, it's quite terrible. This is um, a honeycomb Isaac shark. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research for the IUCN red list assessments, which means uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about this during the week. But we've gone through every single researcher, um, all the data from throughout the country, spoken to everyone that's worked with sharks, and um, no one has seen this species for, since the 1970s. And in fact, a lot of these species we don't have a photo of, other than, as Alison said, sometimes I don't like putting them up too, but all we have is specimen collections, because no one sees them, and no one's seen them in the water. So we're losing some of these species without even knowing much about them. And this one here too, the Natal Shy Shark, has been um, the subject of my fascination and frustration for the last eight years or so. This photo here is from the only record that we know of in the last 10, 15 years, which was a little shark that was tagged and released. Um, so this guy's currently listed as critically endangered, and no one's seen this species. Um, so it's really nice to have some attention on some of these lesser known species that are around and in our waters. Um, another really interesting one is a sawfish. So these are incredibly beautiful animals, um, very odd looking. You can see here they're characterized, they're, they call them like a shark, shark-like batoid or shark-like ray because they actually, they're quite big and bulky like a shark, not just a typical flat shark, <laughs> as Alison was saying. Um, but then they have this amazing chainsaw type rostrum, their nose. Um, and that made, has made them really vulnerable. So you can imagine if you're that big, you've got a big saw like that, they get caught in a lot of fishing gear like gill nets and things like that. So these are one of the most threatened groups of sharks and rays around the world. Um, all of the species are listed as critically endangered or endangered. And here in South Africa, um, unfortunately, we're one of the first places in the world that we can almost, almost certainly say they've gone extinct from. So we used to have two different species of sawfish here in South Africa. Um, this is from a paper, I don't know how well you can see this graph, but what it's trying to illustrate is it's gone through, as I was saying, that we go through like historical records looking for documentation of different species. And what it found is in the 60s and 70s, you could do, depending on all the different surveys and combining them, you could find up to 70 individuals per year um, in different surveys. And then all of a sudden, there was a drop off, and it gradually went down and down. <laughs> so the last sawfish was unfortunately seen in 1997, and that was caught in the shark's board nets um, and released alive. Um, however, the, it, they are protected in South Africa. Unfortunately, they were only protected around the time that the last one was seen. So it's a little too late, unfortunately, and this is an example of what we don't want to get to. We don't want to leave it till we're seeing the last individual before we put some sort of restriction in place. To be fair, protecting any shark in 19, 
90 is pretty, um, you know, is actually pretty proactive for any country. Uh, South Africa was one of the first to protect the white shark, and there wasn't many countries that were protecting species, even sawfish at that time. So, as I said, this is an example of what we don't want to get to. Um, these little sleep arrays as well are another cute little piggy mouth, I think they have there too. But another example of a threatened species that we have here, um, we can find very little records of this. It's been described from five dive sites, um, and unfortunately there are no, not many records of this species that are left either. So accompanying this biodiversity and our threatened species, here in um, southern Africa we've also, we're one of the three hotspots in the world for data deficiency of species, which means we don't know enough about any of these species to be able to accurately assess their conservation status or their population. Um, so about a third, um, and hopefully that will come down soon, but about a third of the species are listed as data deficient. So it, many of them are only known from one, or one to three records or something like that. Um, a lot of them are deep sea species, um, but we really don't know enough about them to be able to to give any indication on whether there's healthy populations or anything like that. Um, and as Alison said before, um, what's really interesting is that it's an average of every two weeks there's a new shark or ray species that's been described, um, which I think is absolutely a staggering figure. Um, a lot of it has been in the last 20 years or so, so from the 1980s to 2000, particularly in the 2000s onwards, there's lots and lots of new species being described. Um, and we may wonder why there's lots of new species being described, but a lot of it is that previously uh, we're fishing in deeper water than we were before, so we're looking at different species that may not have been encountered in the past. And also, people are doing more research in places like fishing markets in tropical countries and some developing countries, where they'll go along to a market and everything's just been you know, categorized as sharks or something, and they look and they're finding new species all the time. So it's pretty incredible how many are being described constantly. And this is just one of the new cat shark species that has been described here. I think there's about... 10 that are currently in revision as well. And this is one I really just wanted to point out. So this little shark, it's not, it's not South African and it's not endemic, but this is the first shark described of 2019. So this was by our colleagues um, William White and Peter Kine, and this was a shark that they went and found um, that was historically found in the Philippines and Vietnam. So they found old specimens and, again, going through old records of this species. And unfortunately, this species hasn't been seen for about 40 to 70 years. And so as my colleague said it, it's hello and goodbye to the first shark of 2019 that's probably extinct as well, which is really unfortunate. And um, just also shows us that we really need to be paying attention to what species there are out there. We could be driving species to extinction before they're even described why we need taxonomy. <laughs> um, and this little species here is Austin's guitarfish. Um, so this is a little, as everyone calls them in South Africa, sand sharks, which make up actually quite a lot of different species. Um, and this one was just recently described the last couple of years by our colleague as well. Um, and this one is found really close to shore. Um, is probably encountered quite frequently as well by fishermen and divers, and it's in a, quite a heavily fished area or previously fished area in Kuzilu Natal. But it just shows you as well, we can have a fairly common species that's very close to shore, but because everyone's not really paying attention, could be an undescribed species. So that's another interesting one. And actually, uh, the, the scientist who described this is coming over to hopefully describes a new species this year as well in this group. And on that note, I'm going to wrap up. Um, thank you again all for coming and your enthusiasm, and thank you, Alison, for having us. And if anyone has any questions for either Alison or I, um, please let us know. Thank you. <laughs>
feed on by those animals that will find them. Yeah. Oh, um, so so they'd be very vulnerable, um, and in fact, um, I was very fortunate to witness. It was incredible. I was witnessing. I was watching this little um, baby puff at a shy shark swimming on the reef, and all of a sudden, an octopus grabbed it. So uh, um, it's quite quite interesting. When they're little, they are very vulnerable, and then they'll try and stay um, hidden as much as possible. And then they got that camouflage, which they they try to, but it doesn't always work. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, there's, there's actually um, quite a number of different ways. So um, one of the traditional ways of doing it is by fishing. And um, fishermen uh, are um, sometimes got single lines uh, or they've got lines with hundreds of, of hooks on them. And um, Charlene is a scientist that uses that technique to actually survey vast areas um, by laying these lines down and then actually documenting what is, what is caught. Um, and then another way of doing a survey um, is by diving, for example. So instead of fishing um, where some species might not actually bite onto a hook, then you could actually do a survey while diving, scuba diving, and then you have a specific area that you swim through, and then you document an IV, um, the different species. And there's, there's, yeah, there's fish market surveys where, where scientists like um, Katie will, will go in, and then they'll go and look at what the fishermen have caught and then uh, that's where a lot of new species are actually described, not from going out onto the water at all, but um, going into the fish markets and finding rare and unusual um, species from those. So that's another kind of survey. Do you want to talk about the sand sharks? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Charlene. Yeah, I think, I mean, South Africa is probably slightly different to the Western Indian Ocean. It was really interesting in the workshops that we've been doing recently because anything that is caught in the Western Indian Ocean is eaten somehow. It doesn't matter what part of an animal or something like that. Um, here in South Africa, we do have very good management in place comparatively, and we don't always take all the individuals, but I'm interested to hear what's going on there. So it sounds like if they put them down, they just well, sell they them informally. The and then they go into the main business, you know, business. So I think what you do, I don't know they're going to be eaten, they say. But no. they were not, they put them into sort of So this was my Christmas.